Hi, welcome. I'd like to introduce Dr. Barry Taft tonight. He's been a parapsychologist for 40 years, started out at a university at UCLA at their lab. Uh, his famous case is The Entity. A uh, movie was made on that case in the 80s with Barbara Hershey. On a personal note, I've known Barry for about 10 years. We've been friends and we work together. And I don't come up, up here very often, but I like that. This is the premier investigator in the field. Thank you. To date me, let me say, I've been in the field 45 years now, but who cares? What's well, a few decades between friends? Um, to start off, let me make it clear. I am not a paranormal investigator. A paranormal investigator is a plumber by day who chases demons at night, <laughs> who has no academic training or scientific education. A uh, parapsychologist is one who investigates and studies scientifically the interaction between our bodies and the environment in ways we do not yet understand. Energetic exchange, energetic exchange between us and the environment. Soviets used to call it psychoenergetics. And from what we're learning over the last, for me, 45 years, is extraordinary. Let me make a couple of statements to preface the beginning of this. Um, you've heard the story with three blind men and the elephant, right? So one blind man is holding grasp the elephant's leg and thinks, it's a tree, it's a tree trunk. No. The other holds the elephant's trunk and thinks, it's a hose. No. The third is holding the elephant's tail, it's a rope. They're all wrong because they can't see the elephant. Imagine you're on a lake, you're sunbathing at a lake, and you see a wake being produced in the water, but you can't see the boat. That's where we are today, in parapsychology, not in paranormal investigations. That's television. The, another way to describe it is we're investigating the effects of an unknown cause. Parapsychology is broken into two primary areas. One is the mental phenomena, ESP, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, psychometry, retrocognition, um, things like that, remote viewing. The other area is the physical domain, which is psychokinesis, which is macroscopic and microscopic, as well as um, pyrokinesis, objects spontaneously combusting into flame. Um, I've dealt with a little bit of both of these areas, um, a little background on me. There is two reasons I'm in this field standing before you here tonight versus sitting there looking at someone else. What got me into this were my own experiences. If it was just scientific curiosity, oh great, that's okay. But when it happens to you, not the ghost stuff, not the poltergeist stuff, not the psychokinetic stuff till recently, but when paranormal things happen to you, you then question why, what's going on? Why me, why not my family and friends? So growing up as a kid, you've heard some of these stories before, but bear with me, they'll be short and succinct. I remember uh, in the fifth grade, you're 10 years old, in the courtyard during recess, blonde girl Christine's walking towards me wearing a long blue dress, blue-eyed blonde girl. And I'm looking at her, and the only way to describe what happened would be like color x-ray vision coming on, Superman, but it's real. And I'm looking at her and I go, oh, what's that? I'm 10. I see in her right, under her right area, where the, below the ribcage, there's a plastic bag under her dress and a tube going into her body. I'm 10. I didn't know the word a colostomy. So that's what she had. I went up to her. I said, what's that weird bag in that tube? She freaked out, got the teacher. They dragged me in the principal's office. And the principal said, did you sneak in the girl's bathroom or did you look under her dress? I said, I did neither. It just came on. And they said, what do you mean it came on? You know, like x-ray vision. He goes, yeah, OK, look, you're in trouble. I said, look, sir, you've got that appendix scar that's never healed. It's always purple. Now I call it a keloid because I have a medical background. And um, he turned purple on me. He called my parents, what's going on? And he said, don't ask. Just don't ask. <laughs> um, in, the, in the sixth grade, some bicycles started being stolen from school. And I went up to this one girl. I remember what she looked like, but I don't remember names. And uh, I said to her, admit it. You're the one who's stolen the bikes. And she broke down crying, and she admitted it. How'd you know? I looked at you, and that's what came into my head. Okay, so you're psychic. Okay. So this stuff's been going on my whole life. When JFK was inaugurated president, 1961, I bet my parents $25 that he would be killed in office around Thanksgiving of 63. 
How do you know? I said, I don't know. That's what comes into my head. And they thought I was nuts. Okay. It happened, as we know. I didn't know why. I just knew when. I didn't say die. I said killed in office. And, of course, it happened. My parents didn't speak to me for weeks. So my parents were getting worried that I wasn't human. Okay, so years go by. The experiences keep happening, keep happening, out-of-body experiences, telepathic, precognitive. Um, today, if things happen to you, in some degrees, you can't be as open about it or you go to jail. Imagine this. It's not, let's say it's current time. You have a dream about a 747 crashing at a particular place. You know where, you know when. And you, it's so vivid, you call the FAA and tell them. The plane crashes, they arrest you. FBI, Homeland Security, you go to jail even if you're not guilty. They need to put someone away, right? So take it back to 75. 747s were just in service for a while. I have a pilot's license. I'm a big aviation nut. God knows why, but I am. And had I been taller with better vision, I would have been in the Air Force, but I was saved from going to Vietnam. So in the dream, I'm piloting a 747. I knew the instrument layout of the, ca the cabin, the cockpit, and we're flying. Somehow I knew we were over South Africa. I knew we were TWA because the plane was red and white. Suddenly the panels the go dark, the turbofan drone ceases. We're dropping like a stone. We hit the ground, I fly up. Okay, big deal. Woke up out of bed, I was with a girlfriend at the time, and I said, I just crashed in a plane. She said, what? And I was really upset. So we checked the next few days, 747 had never gone down. They were pretty new in service. A few days later, the first 747 went down. There was a TWA on its approach to South Africa. If I called the FAA then, they would have thought I was nuts. If I, today you do it, you go to jail. Times have changed. Okay, so let's go forward more time. I wrote, there was a woman working at UCLA by the name of Dr. Thelma Moss. Um, she ran the parapsychology lab. She used to be an actress and a writer. Um, her husband was an actor and producer. In fact, he was in the first season of Star Trek. He played Kodos the Executioner in, um, um, oh, I forgot the name of the episode interview because I'm a real big, well, I'm more than a Trekkie. Um, the, um, the, the whole point of it is, it's, yeah, um, it's not Home Lawrence for Adonis. Anyway, Thelma was, a, was an actress and a writer. When her husband died, she went back to school, got a, do a doctorate in clinical psych, became a, medical, a professor of medical psychology at UCLA, started to run the lab, do experiments. So I heard about her, I wrote, about, wrote to her, she never asked her, answered. Wrote her again, no. Called her, no. Okay, forget it. Um, a few months later, I met one of her graduate students. I was an undergraduate at the time, and this is in 69. And uh, I told him, and okay, set up a meeting with Dr. Moss at her home in Beverly Hills, five minutes from where I lived. So she, I talked for a few minutes, she goes, stop. She threw me her keys, I held her keys, and what do you pick up? Psychometry. Hmm, I see a fat blonde woman, really heavy, blonde hair, blue eyes, rather attractive, but she's overweight, got a really loud mouth, and likes to scream and yell a lot. Her name's Shelley. Her best friend was Shelley Winters, and that was inaccurate, if not necessarily um, a good, well, flattery description of her. Okay, Thelma was impressed. I said, okay. So they did a study on me. Started in 69, ran through 70. They did a couple studies. They documented what I could do, telepathy, precognition. Okay, great, so you're psychic. Okay. The study was published in a medical journal in 1974 and 5 called Behavioral Neuropsychiatry. Hopefully that didn't reflect on what they thought of, the, of the, uh, the article. But some of the data collected, not the parapsychological data, but some of the neurophysiological data collected, I mean, it was so bizarre, the journal refused to publish it, as they thought that the instruments that were used to measure me were out of work, they were out of service, they were producing artifacts. Five different instruments in different parts of the medical center, highly unlikely. Okay. Years, so I developed my own interest there. I became interested in two things. Laboratory work, we developed a program for ESP training, PSI training, which ended up becoming later remote training for remote viewing. And then the really interesting part was the work investigating cases in the fields of poltergeists and hauntings and apparitions and doppelgangers and UFO abductions and thing like, things like that. Over the course of 45 years, I've investigated close to 4,500 cases of gaunt hauntings and poltergeists and ghosts. And 99% of the time, 
you go there, you interview the people, and you go home. That's it. Nothing happens. The probability, let me put it this way, the probability of you're going out on investigation and regularly encountering phenomena as depicted on these idiotic and fraudulent paranormal reality shows is the probability of you winning the Powerball lottery at the half billion dollar level about five times in a row. No, it doesn't happen. Trust me, if you're a producer of a paranormal reality show, you've got a real problem on your hands. You can't have talking heads for 41 minutes and 12 seconds out of an hour. You've got to have something happening. So you fake it, which they do. You embellish and exaggerate what might have happened, which most of the time doesn't. Or you populate and, and the show with rather colorfully animated individuals who might be more interesting than if ghosts showed up to begin with. Um, recently, on my website, barrytoff.net, one of the last blogs I wrote that I published, not that I posted, is called Cielo Drive Convergence. Um, I worked on the case. It's in Beverly Hills, Benedict Canyon. The name might ring a bell. It's the street where the Sharon Tate murders took place in 1969. I was there for about a year, and it was the most volatile, most... It was a case that made me sick every time I went. Not necessarily because of the people, because the geomagnetic field there was anywhere from 10 to 100 times normal. And it's an honest-to-God U.S. Geological Survey geomagnetic anomaly site. They don't know why. It just is. Meteorite buried there. There's no iron there. The hills are too young, geologically young. No magnetite. They don't know. Okay. So they did a show uh, earlier in April this year on Paranormal Witness, the bastion of lies and untruth regarding the paranormal. Anyway, they completely rewrote the history of the show, of the case. It began not in 2002, but in 2005 and 6. They, people took credit for things that never occurred. They lied. They lied. They lied. They lied. They lied again. Why? Because the real story was too serious. So if you read the last thing, I comment in the end about the nature of Psi, what I call the Psi Lie Network, P-S-I Lie Network, rather than Sci-Fi, it's a more appropriate title. Anyway, um, most of what I'll be talking about here is on my website and is in my book here, Aliens Above, Ghosts Below. It's on Amazon and on Barnes & Noble. And it is in Barnes & Noble stores, the few that remain open. Okay, so the work at the lab was interesting. Um, we had a program that went, ran from 1970 through 1987. Mostly UCLA went private when the lab shut down in 1980. And we took normal healthy people with some interest or proclivity in this ability, nature, ESP, and we trained them. Small percentage developed good abilities, most nothing. Some at the other end, you could hit them over the head with a million dollars. They wouldn't show any ESP no matter what you did. But the ones who developed were extraordinary. The equivalent or the metaphor is this. We all drive cars. How many can race? I used to race cars professionally. I'm still a gearhead. We can all drive. How many get on a track doing 200 miles per hour, per hour or 140 through corners and live to tell about it? Not many people. You lack the coordination, stamina, reflexes. Okay. So some people are trainable. Others were not. But we learned extraordinary things about this ability that we never imagined. And the conclusions are, this is in my book and on my website, they used to think with ESP, there's a signal going from person to person, A to B. No. No. The best way to describe it is this. Um, everything is everywhere. Remember there was a song for old enough, Joe Cocker, everything is beautiful. Remember that? Well, my theme was everything is everywhere. Here's how it may work. The best theory of brain function put forth by Dr. Carl Prebram was holographic, neural, neural holographic processes. Evidence strongly supports this as being true. Consciousness may follow in this. This is in my book on my website. And space-time may work like this. So it appears that if you're able to access information around you, you can access it anywhere. Because if this were a piece of paper and I tore it in halves, quarters, eighths, sixteenths, whatever, you get little piece. Hologram, you cut it in small pieces and each piece will recreate the whole because the information is equally distributed on each paper by the holographic method. Okay, now, this suggests that the past information still exists, not the events. 
the information. This also suggests that the future's information may already exist. Not the events, the information. Information of events at a distance may do, does exist. So that means you're accessing a mechanism which we may not have much control over other than seeing it. We're passive viewers. Okay, so the process worked, and examples on my website, in my book. Um, <laughs> this was great. This woman came, and I won't use her name because you know who she is now, but she sent a name, I forgot his first name, and we described his last name phonetically, but, and we just described his house and details, and so we went to the feedback session, and she's going to the tape, and she's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. The last thing we all commented on, and we could now hear, hear each other speak. We had mics on and headphones. This is in the 70s now. This is not now. We all described, independently of each other, this individual being viciously beaten and mugged. He didn't even know where they were. He didn't know who, how old, where, nothing. Well, the, the woman took the tape. Yes, yes, yes. No, the guy's never been mugged. A few days later, the girl calls me back, and she's frantic. What happened? Well, you know when the group was? Yeah, Wednesday night? Yeah. My friend was being viciously beaten and mugged in San Francisco at the time the group was being done. A run. We didn't know it. She didn't know it. We were getting it from the source, which was him, or this holographic space, holonomic space-time uh, storage mechanism. But the bottom line with all this is simple. There's a, a concept called implicate order, discussed on my website, one of the blogs, implying and suggesting very, very scientifically that our long-term memories are not, not stored in our own brains. A very famous neurobiologist at Caltech spent 30 years validating this. It was so effective, they fired him because they didn't like what he said. Okay, so they got rid of him. Anyway, if, if this is real, and I believe it is, and the way in which we recall our own memories is by and large remote viewing, it's distant from ourself, that's paranormal. So the way we function on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is paranormal. The way we remember our own memories. And this isn't me talking. These are academicians. These are scientists talking. Okay, so another instant. We got bored with the real-time ESP. Anyone could do that. Okay. Boring, been there, done that, thousands of sessions. Let's try a remote viewing, a remote precognitive viewing Let's see if we could pick up what would be happening randomly the next week. We felt like idiots. Isolation room, UCLA, pitch darkness, couldn't see or anything. Excuse me, talk everyone down. State of deep re hypometabolic relaxation. Describe what we're seeing. We describe a tall blonde woman, blue eyes, very attractive, dressed in a beautiful pantsuit, gorgeous, like business professional. And we describe a three-story home in the Hollywood Hills, a baby grand piano. We describe a whole bunch of details. And we describe a tall man, dressed in black, head to toe. Black clothing, black gloves, black boots, black hat, black mask, black cape, and an imposing sword. And are we losing our minds? Okay. The next week, new people came in from third parties who knew nothing about what we had done prior. Each new person was given a random number, a number sealed in an envelope, an opaque envelope. We then rolled dice. New people opened their envelopes to see who would be randomly chosen. And then this person goes, oh, me, that fits my number. We didn't remember what we said a week ago. It was a week ago. We gave her the tape. We said, anything you hear that relates to you, stop the tape and comment. Okay. It's an audio tape, not videotape. So, playing the tape back, she hears a perfect description of herself, even to the clothes she was wearing. Coincidence, yeah, sure. There were 24 chairs in the room, each numbered. She, of her own accord, there were only one chair that was controlled, that was mine, because I had a trolls that trolled the tape during the sessions. So, there were 23 open chairs, she picked a chair on her own. It happened the chair we named by number. Coincidence. Describe the house correctly, the baby grand piano. Coincidence, coincidence, coincidence. We'd get to the tall man dressed in black with a sword and the mask. She turned white. She said, how do you know who I am? I went, what? How do you know who I am? And I went, what are you talking about? I'm, she goes, my name, last name is William. Tony, she, my name's Tony Williams. I go, who? 
My father's Guy Williams, and even when I say it now, I got goosebumps. Her father was the actor who played Zorro for Disney on TV for a couple of years. And she said, well, wait, wait a minute. When did you make this tape? A week ago, 144 hours ago. But I didn't know I was coming here until two hours ago. How, how could you? I said, that's the point. I don't like this. Hey. I'm not creating the rules, I'm just giving you information. She really freaked out. She never came back. I don't blame her. And my academic brethren said, we guessed. How many men played Zorro on TV? One. Since then, there'd be many others who played him in the movies, but not back in 1978. Okay, but it was coincidence. Okay, enough of that. Let's go into the really good stuff, the field investigations. 1968. Shows my ears. Investigating case in Pasadena. Elderly couple, they lost their cat. I was a cat person. If I never saw a dog again, I could care less, but I love cats. So they lost their cat, and they were seeing the cat. And I went, okay, so they're depressed, and they're having hallucinations. And I'm in the home interviewing them, and talking, and suddenly something jumps on my lap. I can feel it, I can hear it, but I can't see it. Its, its paws are kneading my jeans. I can feel it. And I hear it, a purring though. I couldn't touch it, but it could touch me. It jumped off onto the couch, the couch depressed, and it was gone. Did my opinion change on what they told me? Damn well it did. What did I experience? Suggestion, maybe? Okay, let's come forward a little ways. 1970. Uh, near the near Inglewood, um, I get a visit in the lab from a man. I won't use his name because he's well known. His grandparents were killed in a violent auto accident, and they lived in uh, Inglewood. So the neighbors kept seeing them taking out the lawn, taking out the garbage, and doing the lawn, even though they're dead. Even the neighbors didn't know they were dead. So they contacted the grandchildren, and they brought me in. And the house had been unoccupied for many months except everything was covered in dust except one break front. So we're walking around the house and we suddenly see a doctor's valise pick up and go across the room. Okay. So this is back, this is 40, 43 years ago. Um, we're holding a seance there, nothing else to do. No power, water in the house. We're in the large living, in the dining room. No, living, no the living room, living room, that's right. And we're held, nothing's happening, just nothing. Pitch black, nothing's happening. We have candles on, nothing's happening. Okay, so I take a break, and I, I, had a, I heard a strange sound in the bathroom. So I go to the bathroom, nothing there. I come out, I see a man in the living room who was not part of our group, much older than us, like well, I, was, I was 22 then. He was, must have been in his 60s, at least. And he'd lun he was wearing khaki slacks and a green shirt. And he lunges at me and starts strangling me and picking me up. And I think I'm little now. I was really little back then. And he starts strangling me. Get out of my house. Get out. And he throws me in the bathtub. And the men came to my help. And they beat him off me. And he fell down. And I got up. My neck was bruised. My clothes were torn and damaged. My neck was red with welts from the, the choking I'd been receiving. And we saw this elderly man, apparition. We didn't know any better. Fade away, like, shoo, slow dissolve. Huh? What was left there was the grandson who brought us to the house. And so he was bruised from the beating he, was getting, he had gotten. And we told him what we saw. And he pulled a picture out from a dresser that had been unused for many months of his dead grandfather. That's what we saw. Attack me. But the men saw the grandfather, the grandfather attack me. The women saw the grandson attack me. So who and what attacked me? And how could we see different things? Little continuity problem. Okay, so we held another seance. I'm kind of, I guess I'm stupid or too brave. And some people left. And we're sitting there and the candle flew across the across the room, hit the carpet, started to fire, so we decided to leave. Got a call a couple of days later from the neighbor. They said, did you leave an animal in the house? I said, no, my colleague's with me here at the lab. And uh, well, I said, well, I thought we heard banging, and growling, weird sounds and lights. We come back to the place, it looks like a typhoon had gone through it, just ripped to shreds. 
except at Breakfront. Okay, that was 1970. Since then, there'd be white families, black families, Hispanic families, Asian families, you name ethnicity, been there. Most of them who knew nothing of this prior phenomenon in the house experienced similar types of events. It's discussed in my book. Okay, um, that was pretty intense, the, one of your first cases out. Somebody tries to kill you. Did it deter me? No. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I used to race cars, as I said. When you're doing 170 or 80 and someone's a few inches next to you, you have to be stupid or really brave. Hopefully I'm brave. I'm not, I haven't died yet behind a car. So um, go forward in time. We had a, oh, Van Nuys, 1971. A family, nice Jewish family, and they were finding money floating down from the ceiling. I said, you're complaining? I mean, I said, can I move in? I could fund my research. Money, 20s, 50s, 100s, up to $15,000. Are you declaring it to the IRS? <laughs> no. Then what's the problem? Well, their kids saw an apparition, a small black man wearing like dungarees and jeans floating down the hallway holding a candle and he went right through the front screen door and another time their eldest son who was a football player in high school, big hulking guy, he was uh, going to the bathroom one night and he saw this glowing thing coming towards him in the hallway and he locked himself in the bathroom, wouldn't come out for a full day. And then when, I guess it must have been a male ghost because when the woman's name was Reggie, when she was in the laundry room in the house, something would pinch and caress her. It eventually stopped once the children had moved out of the house, which is common. Now, before we get through with these cases, the things we've learned, if I went back in time 45 years ago and told myself then what we know now, I'd say, you're out of your mind. No way. The patterns, the data that's emerged is more disturbing, more bizarre than if there were dead people floating around, which I don't think there are. But it's even stranger than that. Okay, let's go to the great, the great beginning, 1974, August 22nd, Culver City, California, Braddock Drive. Um, about a week before my colleague at the time was in Westwood in Hunter's books, one of the only real aspects of the movie The Entity, the character meets a woman whose in real life name was Doris Bither, B-I-T-H-E-R. This is in my book and on my website. Um, rather it looked like idiots in front of strangers, my colleague decided to get her name and number, we call her. Okay, we go out there a week later, August 22nd, it was like it is now, very hot, very humid, but even hotter. Go to her house, it's like a, like a, like a steam bath, and uh, it's horrible. And we sit down and she said, the very first thing the woman says, Doris says, is, I've been repeatedly raped by a ghost, who went, oh God rolled her eyes back. I wrote a big P on the top of the form, which means psychotic. You tell me that from the get-go, it's all downhill after that. Um, now remember, nowadays when I go out on cases, which we don't do much anymore because we don't get calls, because they, they call the people on the shows to come up, the questions I ask are very invasive. They're very probing about your background, your medical background, psychological background, the medicational background, family, family psychodynamic background, family history, and if someone will not reveal that information to me, we're gone, we leave. And when they don't reveal it to you, it's because there's a reason they're not, because you'll know they're, they have problems. So when Doris said this to us, we go, okay lady, oh, nice meeting you, left. Week later, call back, neighbors had witnessed stuff. Okay, this changes the picture independent observation, observers. Okay, we go back to the house, a little cooler. The house stunk. The bedroom smelled like decomposing organic matter, like a body was there. We brought in a sniffer from Hewlett Packard, couldn't find a source for the odors. It was transient, it would come and go. Um, we're standing in the kitchen interviewing her at one point, and the lower cupboard door flies open, and a iron skillet flies out across the kitchen, landing a few feet away from the cupboard. So we checked the cupboard for animals, children, wires, birds, whatever, children. Now, Doris had four children. She had three boys and a little baby girl. We never met the baby girl. Boys were, uh, oldest I think was 16 and down from there. Um, I don't remember all their names, but that's not really that relevant. 
So the case evolved. Once we experience something, we can record something. We took a lot of pictures, some of which you're going to see tonight. We became really interested in what was going on. Okay. Now, we didn't ask all the medical questions we asked today because we were stupid back then. Who thought there was a medical connection? Now there is. So, we started recording these lights, luminous anomalies, not the dumb orbs you see on these shows. I should say right now that 99.9999999999% of orbs have nothing to do with parapsychology or the paranormal. They're artifacts produced by the photography. You don't believe me? Take a bright light source at night, like I hear this, well, see, multiple LED, hold it in a dark room, really dark, and you'll see all the, I can see it here, all these little particulates of dust. They are everywhere at all times. Depending on the environment, they could be more or less, but they're everywhere. If you videotape it, you'll see them. Flap your hands around, guess what? You'll see more of them. Because they start moving because you're moving the air. Nothing paranormal in that. What we saw in the entity case were not these. We began to see these lime green ball this big, zipping around the room. Zipping around the room. We've got, what the? <sighs> Zip, no noise. <laughs> like ball lightning but bigger and always a lime green. Why lime green? I can't tell you unless the energy being emitted or used ionized gases in the room at that, free, at that wavelength which glowed green which would be krypton and no relationship to Superman. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, we saw them, we got one photo of the lights and at one point you see pictures um, Doris is on the bed, the lights are zipped in around her. We have Doris framed by an arc of light. She's sitting on this little bed in this bedroom and lights are zipping around her and we have an arc of light very clearly framing her. And what's really important to remember when you see the picture is that behind Doris, two walls meet at a 90 degree angle. If the light was projected against the walls as in a hoax, the light would be bent in accordance with the walls. It is not. There's a secondary arc in front of that arc that is not bent either. In another picture, you see two other arcs inverted from each other at different angles. And Doris wasn't even in the frame when we took the picture. Um, the case went on. At one point, we sealed the room off from all external lighting sources. Nothing. You could hold a, f a bright light source up to the window. You wouldn't have seen the thing. What happened is the green lights coalesced to the corner of the bedroom and they formed a large apparition. Easily twice my height. I mean, I met it twice. Seven feet tall. Huge. You could see the head, the brow ridge, you could see the jaw, the orbits of the eyes, the upper torso, um, the pectorals, the biceps, all that. But it cut off at the waist. It was articulated. It was moving back and forth, back and forth. And then, it, like a light going out. Gone. Okay. That shook us up. Um, but the problem was we weren't able to photograph it. Twenty over oh five different professional photographers with us. And yet no photograph showed up. That's impossible, right? Well, the other possibility is that there was energy present that was causing us to hallucinate. If you know anything about the work of Michael Persinger, Dr. Persinger up in Canada, he studied the effects of very weak electromagnetic fields on the brain can cause audiovisual hallucinations that are very real. And a lot of people assume this, is, this explains everything. No, it doesn't. It explains some, but not all things. If what we saw was an indeed hallucination induced by this energy, we would all should see something different because as much as we're all human, our brains differ dramatically from one to the other because of age and ethnicity and whatever, a million other variables. But we all wrote down what we saw. We all saw the same thing. So it was not a random influence of some energy affecting our brain directly. So what was it? Okay. Later on, we're, uh, we, we covered the walls in black poster boards. Every board, the reason we did this, we got a ball of light with a tail on it. But we couldn't tell where it was coming from, where it was going to. We had no reference what, or the speed at which it was moving. So by putting up a grid with duct tape forming like a checkerboard, we could tell where it was moving. Everything was numbered magnetically, where the orientation, what was going where. Okay, so we got a call from Doris about one in the morning and she's screaming, we come down, every board has been torn down. Every board has been torn down 
and she's screaming her lungs out, and her kids are freaking out in front of the house. Now, she woman was a little bigger than me, small, diminutive woman, and um, we couldn't prove she didn't do it. We couldn't prove she did do it. But if, if she did, she was a really good actress, and she was not an actress. Anyway, so the, the case kept evolving. So another time we're, we're there, this is all in the book, and chapter three called the real life entity case. And so these lights are zipping around the room again, and we said, okay, we said, tear something off the wall now. And we hear a ripping sound, and a board amongst the lights is torn, the duct tape is ripped off right in front of our face, and the board is flung at Doris and hits her in the head. There are 25 people in this little bedroom. Bedroom one-fifth the size of this room, like a closet, filled with people in a hot August night, and Neil Diamond wasn't there. Um, it was amazing. Do it again. A few minutes later, same thing, zip, 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 another one flew at her, fell at her feet. Amazing. Um, back in those days, there were no commercial videos. It was very crude. There was professional videos, but not commercial videos. We had 35 millimeter cameras. Um, Okay, at one point, the fuse box tore itself out of the wall, was thrown at her, almost hit her. The candelabra was thrown at her, almost hit her. Talked to her kids, they saw things, but we weren't there when they saw them, and kids tend to exaggerate, embellish things for effect, you know. Um, the woman finally moved from Culver City to Carson, frying pan at the fire. We had not exposed her to the media for good reason, because she would have made a terrible witness. She drank like a fish. Did that contribute to the events? We'll never know. Um, so she moved. We finally found her again. Now, shortly after moving into her home in Carson, her neighbors, who knew nothing about her, and she was least wise enough not to discuss her problems with, other, with strangers, they began having poltergeist activity. Banging noises, garbage being dumped on the floor, clothes being thrown around when they weren't home, and then... But so it's a proximity effect. It's like it starts with Doris and it expands outward. Maybe. Now, she then moved from, the, okay, we were then having another seance, and we had a, 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 micro, a cassette recorder with a condenser mic, and s suddenly a vase comes flying across the room, and misses all the people, lands in the middle and shatters. But no one could have thrown it because there was no one near it. Um, that just, Doris decided, okay, I'm moving again. So she moved from Carson to San Bernardino and Riverside. Things happened there, toilet flushing, doors opening, closing, banging on walls, the malodorous stench returned, um, whatever. Same thing over and over again. Um, we lost track of her until the movie came out in 83, talked with her again for a while. She said it all but ended, but I don't think that's the truth. To the efforts of a friend of mine who's here tonight, Javier Ortega, um, he's writing a book on the case that precedes my intervention, my my colleagues' work on the case, and uh, what he's discovered from her children is extraordinary, and we we now now know now that we didn't know then that she was having experiences prior to living on Braddock Drive, but they weren't at the level they were. Now, there were no instruments for measure, portable instruments back in those days for measuring geomagnetic or ionic fields like we do today. In those days, it, everything was rack mounted in labs and had tubes. God, what a horrible thought. And um, um, so the woman disappeared. We haven't heard from her. And, and then I found out through Javier, I should say, that she died in 1999 at the age of 58 of cardiopulmonary arrest but they don't really know what caused her body to stop. Things were still happening. We don't know. She didn't talk to us. Um, we are in the midst of potentially developing a remake, not a sequel, a remake. The case, the movie you saw, if you read the novel, was based on fiction. That's what a novel is. In my book, chapter two, and discussed on my website, is the real case. That is what happened. That is not the fiction of what was transposed into the novel and on the screen. I hated the movie, because I remember the script that Frank, Fili Frank D. Felita and I worked on. He did a magnificent job. I hired another director. He came in, we wrote the script. You know how it goes, like, game over. And the guy was a hack. And that's an understatement. 
Um, and you read, this is in my book and on my website. Um, anyway, so that case came and went. Now what's weird is that we thought this was, we'd never see a case like this again. Wrong. Come 1989, uh, <laughs> um, I was working with someone new at the time named Barry Conrad. I get a call from a woman in San Pedro by the name of Jackie Hernandez. You may have heard about this case, San Pedro. We go out. And the place stunk, just like Jackie's house. She was uh, estranged, separated from her husband, had two young, very young children. We come in the house, and it was, you know, she told us no raping, thank God, no sexual abuse by the phenomenon or whatever. But, oh, but no, let me back it up first, excuse me. My conclusion on the entity case is that it had nothing to do with ghosts or entities raping Doris Byther. Doris had three male children. She claimed she was repeatedly attacked by three male entities. Two small ones would hold her down, and one big one would rape her. She had two young children, small ones, boys, and one bigger, older one. Hello? Psychoanalysis? Hello? She said the woman was very kind of sexually obsessed. She wouldn't ask her, answer almost any of the medical questions we asked of her, even back then. And today, as I told you, if that's the response we get, I just leave. So my conclusions were it was a real case, it was paranormal, but it was not a case of ghosts having sex with someone, spectrophilia. It was an intense psychokinetic manifestation. In parapsychology, there's psychokinesis, which you see in the lab, microscopic stuff affecting random event generators or whatever, or computers. Then you have the macroscopic stuff, which happens in the field, and that's the poltergeist activity, where massive large objects would be thrown around like toys. So now we go to 89. Go out to the house, Barry Conrad, Jeff Recraft, myself, a few other people, on another aug hot August day, and it was really humid. And the house stunk, and she's telling us these stories of disembodied apparitional heads, and disembodied voices, and things being thrown at her. And suddenly we hear this banging noise in the attic. Sounds like a 200 pound rat bounding around the attic. You go up there, no, nothing. Jeff's up there, he's a professional photographer. Something pulled his camera out of his hands. Just, and he came down, he was a real skeptic, he thought we were nuts. But he agreed to help us. And he came down, he was white as a sheet, he was shaking. And went up to look for the camera. The body was on one side of the attic, the lens was on the other, neatly separated but not damaged. The old bayonet mount type cameras. Okay, the case evolved, and at another point, you, this is in the book, and it's in Barry Conrad's video called An Unknown Encounter, and his book called An Unknown Encounter, and it's in my book, Chapter 3. And my book, by Chapter 3, is called The Hazardous Haunting. Why did I pick that title? Jackie Hernandez's maiden name was Hazard. Hey, it fits, right? The shoe fits, or in this case, the ghost fits, use it. Um, so we had these experiences, and Jeff's up in the attic, again, on September 9th, I believe, or 7th, and suddenly, oh, yell, pitch black, Gary Bames up there, another one of our friends, and he hears Jeff scream, turns around, fires the camera, because they couldn't see anything. The cameras kept going out, the gear kept failing. Fires, and we see around Jeff's neck is a clothesline wrapped in a bowling knot that's picking him up over one of the bolts in the rafter, rafters over his head. He was being hung. Had Gary Bay not been there, Jeff would have been strangled, and he would be dead. So we cut him down, came down, he had a rope burn in his neck. He was traumatized. He could have died. Um, Jeff decided it was best not to continue on with this for a while. He walked away. Anyway, Jackie moved up to Weldon near Bakersfield. Little trailer house, get away from her husband, blah, blah, blah. Terrible like, like Doris, different men, different children, you know, whatever, just bouncing around, bouncing around. Anyway, um, they're up in Weldon. I couldn't attend because my father just had a heart attack, so I was helping my mom. And uh, all hell broke loose. Furniture starts being bounced around like toys. Um, objects light up on their own. They're having a seance and the room gets cold and bouncing up and down. And Jeff and his chair levitated in front of six other people. He and the chair levitate up in an arc. They slam to the wall where it meets the ceiling. Jeff's knocked out. He hits the floor. They thought he was dead. Jeff describes the compression in his lower diaphragm. 
and be blacking out and then he found himself on the floor with a bump on his head and his back hurt. Okay, Jackie finally comes back to San Pedro, moves around a lot, comes staying in a hotel, in a motel, comes back to her motel and um, uh, over the, on the walls and ceiling, a big red marker pencil, thick. It said, angry, mad, mad, angry. If you had to describe Jaffe's state of mind, her personality at that point in time, she was disenfranchised. She lost her home. She lost her husband, all because of what was going on, or partly because it was going on. She was mad as hell, and she was angry. Gee, what a shock this was showing up on the walls. And she didn't do it. She was terrified. Um, now, Jeff Wheatcraft, you'll read about in Chapter 3, was repeatedly attacked by the phenomena, repeatedly. And I thought, why Jeff? Well, B Jackie became very attracted to my colleague, Barry Conrad. Barry used to look like a young Elvis. Dark hair, blue eyes, tall, you know, good looking guy. And I think she misinterpreted um, his assistance as one of romantic interest. And therefore, every time Barry was around Jackie, Jeff was there, even when I wasn't there, and Jackie looked at Jeff as an impediment to her growing closer to Barry. She wanted Jeff out of the way. Who did the phenomena keep attacking? Jeff. What a shock. So we're doing a hard copy interview in 93, and I'm telling this to the producer. I thought this woman sounded really bright. I said, and Jackie said, yeah, now that you mentioned, I really do hate Jeff, and I wish she was out of the way. So the producer turns to me, she goes, so, Barry, tell me, is this, so the go Jackie's telling the ghost to do, and the ghost is doing it, go, there's no ghost here. It's Jackie. What? It's a form of recurrent, spontaneous psychokinesis. Mind over matter. Macroscopic PK. Now, what's amazing is it gets even stranger. In Barry's video and in my book, you read about phenomena broke out at Barry Conrad's old apartments in Studio City. Well, every time Jackie came by and left, all this stuff would start happening. Windows would explode, furniture move around, um, the stove would light up by itself, bullets would end up on the stove, uh, scissors were coming through his pillow as he was sleeping, almost cutting his face. And why is this happening? It didn't make any sense. Didn't it? Why this? Well, now we know. I learned it earlier this year. But, and it's, not, it's nothing negative about Barry or Jackie. They're both adults. What I didn't know, that I do know now, is that he and Jackie were having an affair on and off for quite a long time. But Barry turns to look at women as disposable sperm banks. He uses them, takes advantage of them, cook, clean, shop, let me do what I want, and you can leave, another girl comes by. Jackie got really pissed. What was occurring there was the psychokinetic manifestation of Jackie's anger. Yes, I mean, hello. They weren't doing anything that anyone else should do. They're adults, can do whatever they want. She was divorced, he's not married. You know, if she wants to deal with that, he wants whatever. But we're seeing the real world manifestation of that in terms of the phenomena generated. Well, the case ended in about 93, and that's it. It's, these things don't last that long. Now, what's interesting is in the psychokinesis, in the microscopic stuff you see in the lab, with computers and random event generators, there's exhaustion seen, the people trying to make it work. In the macroscopic stuff, with huge objects flying around, people being thrown around. No, there's no fatigue. Nothing. It just, it happens. But this is what's weird. In going back over 45 years of work, there are some commonalities that have stood the test of time. Things I weren't even look at, was not even looking for. Longitudinal data, data trends. The majority, if not all of the people, plagued with these recurring psychokinetic manifestations tend to be either seizure prone or epileptic. Okay? And when they stop taking their medications, the seizures come back as does the phenomena. What a shock. However, most people who are seizure prone or epileptic are not poltergeist agents. That means somewhere in the middle there's a missing or unknown variable. It could be their inability to cope with stress, which I find is a really plausible possibility. Um, now, measuring a human bioelectric field is easy. No big deal. Portable instruments will do that. Not the crap you see on the shows. Engineering-grade instruments will do that. Um, we have those. 
Measuring a biomagnetic field on a handheld device? No. You need superconducting sensors that are cooled by liquid nitrogen or something even better, liquid helium. You can't get those in a handheld device yet that I'm aware of. However, around poltergeist agents, we're measuring magnetic fields over a million times over normal. The average biomagnetic field is around a few microgauss, millionths of a gauss. The Earth's at half a gauss. The human's field is a few millionths. Poltergeist agents have fields over five gauss. Can't imagine why. They're epileptic. But then some people say, I'm not as epileptic as usual problem. And I ask more questions. What about sleep disorders? Well, yeah. What's your medication? Clonopin, whatever. An anticonvulsant. Oh, yeah, I got these spasms in my muscles. I can't sleep. Hello? That's part of the same mechanism. Oh, yeah, now that you think of it, yeah. We're out in a case about, what, six, seven years ago in Covina. Nice lady, moved in a house with her family. And a fixer-upper, beautiful, suddenly her husband starts freaking out, tries to kill her and her kid. They arrest him, they bring him in for testing, doesn't know what happened. Okay, let him home. Suddenly, banging noises, disembodied voices, luminous anomalies. The husband pulls out a gun, they knew what they had, and he kills himself, blows his head off right in the dining room, right where the original owner did 30 years earlier, or 40 years earlier. And the woman was telling us this, and she said, you know, it's weird, after all this, I suddenly became epileptic. No, you didn't become epileptic. You were epileptic, and this triggered it. Oh, does that mean anything? Yeah, it's really relevant. Um, it's to the point now we can go out on a case and predict what we're going to find. To the point where it's like becoming boring, because it's the, the place and faces may change, but the events do not. But the events are byproducts of the subconscious wants, wishes, desires of the individuals there. Now, Cielo Drive, the last blog I put up, it's not in my book, uh, but it's in my website, and I got sick there 20 times over the course of a year. Stopped going, I didn't feel like dying. Um, it's, it's amazing. Disembodied voices, objects thrown at us, growling sounds, um, machines turning on and off, um, magnetic, geomagnetic fields beyond anything we've ever seen, and new crews would come out there, about two-thirds of them would get sick when they were in the house, very ill. Their stomachs, their heads, their joints. Uh, a friend of mine who wrote a really good book called Hollywood Haunted, Laura Jacobson was there. She shows up, I didn't tell her anything, and she felt nauseous, and then she got better. Her husband, John Provost, who played Timmy in the old Lassie series, he came there, and he said he felt like something hit him in the head and the stomach with a baseball bat. He had to leave the house. Um, we were standing in one of the um, um, passageways with some instruments. This was in 2005 with some journalists, and an instrument was on. And so they, the guy said, do you ever get sick here? Do you ever feel sick? And I was about to say something, and all of a sudden, whoa, full-scale deflection from almost normal, a few milligauss to a couple hundred milligauss, like several gauss. And we both had this wave of nausea. I said, you mean like that? He said, yeah. Yeah, all the, yeah, yeah. We were able, you can measure it. It was so severe, this girl came up to the house, my friend brought, and she really liked me, and she said, you want to spend the night here with me here? No, 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 you don't want to spend the night here. No, you don't want to spend the night with me? That's not the problem. I want to be alive to remember it in the morning. Like not having a heart attack? Um, there is, I write in my book, the only way I could go back to the house, the future uh, is to build a suit, like an astronaut suit around me, made of mu metal or gyron, magnetic permeable material, which would insulate my body from the geomagnetic field. I'd look like a chunky alien wearing oxygen tanks and a helmet, but I wouldn't get sick. So is there a way to shield the place? Yep. Very, very expensive. Um, there is no money on earth that would get me to go back there. I would do, oh, we had remote trucks come out from a few networks. The trucks would crash in front of the house electronically. Their equipment would fail. What a coincidence. And then some medium was there who I called a, a half-baked or a burn, because when I hear that term, I just, oh, please. Um, I, um, 
she said, this house is evil. I go, why is the house evil? It's making me sick. I said, no, no, the house isn't making you sick. The geomagnetic field is. She goes, what? I said, it was giving you an orgasm. You think it was healing you. <laughs> oh. oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And it was a cavalcade of wackos because the house over the years. Over the years, like the Disneyland of the insane and the wackos. It was unbelievable. The Mount Everest, the hauntings in my backyard, because I live only eight minutes away from there. But what's scary, they, when they were building the homes on the hill where this man's home is built, they found, and they had to drill blind because their instruments wouldn't work because of the magnetic field, they found empty magma chambers what lava is called before, which is the surface. And that means a long time ago, there might have, could have been, might have been a volcano back there in Benedict Canyon and northern Beverly Hills. That'd be good. Yeah, that would end Rodeo Drive's rain, wouldn't it? Um, and they said, if you start smelling hydrogen sulfide or sulfur dioxide, leave. And don't spread this around. It'll destroy the property value. If there's a volcano, there won't be people to worry about property value. Oh, and it may take thousands of years. I'm not worried about it. So, in the end, we've learned things that I couldn't have imagined 45 years ago. And I'm convinced now from what we know that we can perhaps reverse engineer this process. And that is, let me take a pill, the wonders of age, taking medicine at certain times. We might be able to modify environments electromagnetically to simulate what happens in these geomagnetic anomalies or electromagnetic anomalies so that we could artificially trigger the event. Rather than sitting around waiting like a bunch of clucks scratching our heads, we make the events happen. In neurobiology or neurophysiology, it's called photic driving. You EEG, you're wired, and they, your eyes are closed, and they pulse a light, a strobe in front of your eyes to measure how your, what your brain waves are doing. This would be the same, except instead of using light, you use other wavelengths, electromagnetic energy. I'm convinced we could trigger these events, but you might harm people. That is, n you never, Hippocratic Oath, you do never do that under any circumstances. And then what if we could do it without harming? So let's say you're in one of these environments and you ramp up the environment. You play with the, the pulse envelope and the wavelength, the frequency, the pulse duration, frequency and repetition rate, all that stuff. Mumbo jumbo to most. And oh look, look at these things are all walk, oh my God. That's it. We fired out. And then the apparition turns to you and goes, uh, why are you doing this to us? <laughs> what? Why are you doing this to us? What are you talking We don't want it. You're killing us. No, you're already dead. Okay. This brings us back to what I started with. If consciousness is a continuum, we may not be born when we come into being, we might die when we end, physically. Consciousness may be something we inhabit a body, a shell, a, a, a vacuous facility, and then we leave it when it won't support us anymore. We all know what reincarnation is supposed to be. What about pre-incarnation? People go, what? We, if you've lived before, why aren't you living again? I don't care what, where we've been, I want to know where we're going. We know what happened back there. Why well, can't remember what we're going to be doing in the future? It's all there, right? It's all available for the picking if you can access the information. And here's the story. 1970, I was in college. Met a beautiful girl in psych department. We were dating, long story short. It was great. She had lived in, the, in Northridge, so that was pretty far. I lived in West LA. So everything was great, and then the dreams came, and the dreams, we're driving under cul-de-sac to her family's house, and a, a large, dark car came out. I saw her in the passenger seat. I didn't see me in the driver's. I saw, assume it was me, nor do I see the dashboard. And we were in a horrible accident. She was badly injured. It looked like the driver was dead, blood everywhere. I go, well, this is not good. I had four or five dreams. We're not having this relationship. So I ended it. She was really pissed. I said, I'm not risking this. not important. I'd rather we live than be together and die. I'm like, anyway, she didn't like it, thought I was making it up. Yeah, 
end relationship ended. I don't blame her. I would have done the same thing. And a few months later, guess what happened? She's dating someone else. And everything I saw happened except I wasn't driving. That didn't change a damn thing. I put my ego, put me in the driver's seat. Um, could I have? We don't know. The most important question to which I hope to find an answer. Some of you may know where this line comes from, so don't laugh. The, mis the most important question to which I hope to find an answer is can man control his destiny? Can he change the shape of things to come? That comes from the time machine, 1960. Rod Taylor uttered it. And that, at the, the bottom line, may tell us more about the nature of reality. Um, it may be that it's the best of both worlds. Let's say you're swimming in a pool and it's all nice and cool and refreshing. Oh, look, it's all random brownie in motion of water molecules. Then you back up and you go, oh, no, the pool is in a glass and it's contained. So from one perspective, in the pool, it's all random. From another perspective, it's not. In other words, if you're in the glass, it's random. If you're outside of it, no, it's not. Because the glass must conform to the shape of the container. Do we have control over our destinies? I don't know. If I had to make a bet, I'd say we have no more control over our future than we have over our past. Depressing, but since we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day, it doesn't matter. We're still going to live out the lives we choose. I have a penchant for knowing crazy people when I meet them. Um, a woman moved in my building years ago, tall, lanky, blonde. I looked at her. I instantly disliked her. Didn't know why. Instant, it's like told friends in the building, she'll be evicted very shortly, don't worry. How do you know? Look at her. She's crazy. Look at her. Look at her. There's something wrong with her. She was evicted, harassing like half the tenants in the building. She was mentally ill. Um, guy moved in the building. I didn't know the guy, nothing. He looked like he was a couple of fries short of a Happy Meal. Yeah, they evicted him. I just, look at him. I mean, and what do you mean look? Look at him. Uh, you get these feelings, you get these impressions. Um, a blind date three years ago, beautiful girl, I met her online, stunning. She said her name is Susan, we're having dinner. I said, your name's Susan, your name's Nancy. She goes, huh? You don't live in Beverly Hills, you live in San Pedro. She goes, how do you know this? Well, you're sitting in front of me. So what's the lie, what are you lying to me for? Can I leave? I said, yeah, go ahead. That was that. So the... And one other thing, you'll see this in my book, in chapter 10, and on my website. Sometimes, this, most of the time, this stuff is great, because it's fascinating, it's a never-ending explorations of the unknown. But other times, it brings home a fact that you don't like and you can't change. 1977, I met a girl I could have married. She looked like, if, well, if you know actors from the past, a long-dead actress named Mary Blanchard. Exactly. Same height, feet, hair, eyes, nose, mouth, figure, but also obviously younger. And we met on a case. Everything was fine, we're, we're involved, everything's perfect. And then the dreams, I, oh no. And the dreams were, it's, it's July 22nd, something kills the relationship. I don't want this to end, it's perfect, everything, it's perfect. Every, we were like two, one person living in two bodies. It was everything, emotionally, intellectually, physically, sexually, it was like great. We could be in a quiet room and say the same things at the same time without a stimulus. Wow. So why is it going to end? I kept writing, I don't know, I don't know. I wrote it down, I don't know. I forgot about it. It'll go away. It's not a self-fulfilling prophecy. The date shows up. We're together. She lived in the Hollywood Hills. July 22nd, 1977. Her father was the deputy station chief for the CIA that I was working with at the time. And I never met him. I didn't even know who he was, but we wake up, she will come out from under the covers, and she's sobbing. Why didn't I help her? I go, with what? When they took me, I go, with who took you? They, I go, who's they? When the room lit up, I go, what are you talking about? She said, well, she was lifted up out of the room, room got real bright, she found herself in a round metal room on a pedestal table. We strained her neck, her, her, neck, her ankles, her abdomen, and her wrists very tightly, and these little guys around her, no nose, no ears, big black eyes, you know what we're talking about, grays, whatever, and they were cutting, probing, scratching, and doing terrible things to her, and they told her, don't worry, we're not going to hurt you, but they were hurting her. And I said to her, does she remember, she's still under the covers, and I met her because she was a, a poltergeist activity around her. 
and she said, uh, she finally comes out. She's bleeding from her nose, bleeding from her ear, bleeding from her mouth, bleeding from her eye, bleeding from her rectum, bleeding from her uterus, and she wasn't menstruating. But worse than that, around her ankles, her wrists, her neck, her abdomen, her ankles, were black and blue bruises, like she'd been constricted for quite a great deal of time. Her hair had been cut, little chunks of flesh taken out of her back. She had a complete breakdown, became a religious zealot, but of a very, very unusual type. And the relationship ended. Now, what's interesting is the power had gone off that night for two hours in her condo. What I learned days later was that people who knew nothing about what happened to her is that they saw glowing something hovering over that part of the Hollywood Hills at that time. Does that mean she was abducted? Maybe. Does it mean she wasn't? No. I, I don't know. But she claims to have been re-abducted many times. I don't know. But whatever that was, had it not occurred, I would have been married. My life would have taken a turn I could not begin to imagine. I mean, I would have had to make a work a living. Oh, God, it's scary enough as it is. But, um, and then another incident, 19 late 70s. Case is the network executive. I can't say the name of him or the network. Poltergeist activity at his home. He and his wife, I met him, really nice people. Very, very, it was on the slowing down by the time we got there. It was waning. So they're taking a ride up north, a little vacation, and they see what I thought was a meteorite about to hit coming down the hill, so they followed it. It was early evening. And they come around a bend in a canyon, and there on the ground is a disc, and these little guys, and they're doing stuff. And they, what? And the beings looked at them, aimed something that looked like a light or a metal thing, and there was a pop of light, and the next thing they knew, they woke up on the freeway many miles away. They subsequently began having memories about it all, and it, their marriage got destroyed, ended. He couldn't hold the job anymore. She had a breakdown. Um, it's possible people hallucinate these things, possible some cases are, you know, stirring up repressed memories of people being abused. But then there are cases that, you know, what happened to the girl with me? The girl with me was normal. She had no interest in ufology. If I ever brought it up, she, don't bother me, I have no, don't want to hear about it, I don't care. Which might have mean she had already been abducted and she was worried about it. Had it not occurred, I would have been married, but it didn't happen. And since then, the prob as I get older, I have l every day that I age, I have less in common with more people. <laughs> because they have their lives and I live mine. I've never had a normal job, ever. Um, uh, I don't have eight to five, nine to six. My work is my life, my life's my work. Other than this, in writing, and then I own six medical patents. And uh, you'll read about some of the stuff on my website. Um, also, I've written for the entertainment industry in movies and TV shows, things like that, as a script doctor. The only thing else that interests me are cars. I used to race road race. I'm still obsessed with cars. If I had all the money in the world, I get the new Ferrari, La Ferrari. It's only 1.7 million. Yeah. Or the 918 Porsche, it's only 900,000. Chump change. So listen, we'll take a break. We'll come back. I'll show us some of these really intriguing slides from these cases, and they'll be open for Q&A. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 